So what you gonna do, the Hot Dollar? Or Crypto Bull Guy? And his crypto maniacs? And the entire cryptocurrency market run wild on you! Welcome in there, mate. I am the Crypto Bull God, and this is the recorded on Wednesday, airing on Wednesday, July 7th, 2021 Crypto Bull God Podcast. You can find me on Twitter, TradingView, and YouTube at Crypto Bull, at Crypto Bull God. That was a horrible impression. Uh, I know I offended somebody by doing that. Actually, that should be offensive to every single person that just listened to that. I don't know where that came from. I just was kind of jotting down some notes here on some things that I wanted to talk about. And then for some reason, I wanted to talk in an accent. I think that might have been Australian. Is there anybody Australian out there? I apologize. <laughs> I apologize for that. I'm sorry, that was terrible. Just, it, you know, these, these, these things, sometimes they come over you and, you know, you want... This is my shit right here. This is my podcast. This is my podcast. If you're tuning in, you're listening, to, you're listening to me and you're listening to the content I create, it's coming from me. No one's going to tell me what to do. So I'm going to do what I want to do. If I want to talk in an accent, it's how I'm going to talk in an accent if I want to. So I apologize if I offended anybody. But I'm just trying to have some fun. Hey, welcome in. I hope everybody had a good 4th of July weekend. For those that follow me on Twitter at Crypto Bull God and saw the video I put out there, I just wanted to comment real quick that the two women who were in that video were very good sports. I can't break character. Like, this is like a wrestling thing, right? So I don't want to break character. But uh, I kind of, you know, I met these two girls and I gave them kind of a very quick lowdown on what I was looking to do. And they were, they were very good sports. They were really good sports. There's a 0.0001% chance they're listening. So I won't, <laughs> I won't say thank you, but, uh, but I had a lot of fun this, um, this 4th of July weekend. So for those that don't know, actually, I think it's on my Twitter profile here. I'm looking, yeah. So I'm located in Fort Lauderdale. Um, I don't mind sharing that. So I'm located in Fort Lauderdale and, um, the weather was beautiful. The weather was beautiful. And of course, you know, the weather apps were no help in distinguishing that. I have two different weather applications on my iPhone. One said 50% chance of rain. One said 15% chance of rain. Yes. And believe me, as a numbers person, that in itself, the distinguishing uh, the fact that you could have two percentages, that much of a disparity between you know, two numbers, 50% and 15%, that would drive me nuts in itself. But each weather app told me that there was a moderate to high likelihood of rain. And guess how much it rained? Take a guess. Take a guess. Zero. Not that I'm complaining. I mean, it was a beautiful weekend, but uh, we need to get some actuaries in there and meteorology to increase the precision of those forecasting models. Because right now, uh, sorry, boy, I'm, I'm starting off the bat here offending people. Don't mean to, don't mean to offend any meteorologists out there, but those models tend to be shit when looking at, uh, when looking at my phone, they're never accurate. So today it was supposed to rain. It hasn't rained a bit, but anyway, I had a great 4th of July weekend, um, in Fort Lauderdale and there was a new place that opened up that ha a newer place that opened up that has a uh, pool at the top on the roof and a bar and, um, Met up with uh, one of my friends who had a birthday and met some other people while I was there. I got to tell you, it's kind of funny because um, uh, I have enough common sense and intuition and I'm actually a fairly intelligent individual. There's no way I could be a credentialed actuary if I wasn't. But I totally intuitively, I totally intuitively, intuitively it makes sense to me that if you look at me on the surface without actually having a conversation with me, there's a lot of assumptions you could, you could make, right? Check out my Twitter profile photo. <laughs> so there's, a, there's a lot of assumptions you could make, right? Imagine the assumptions someone would make at, you know, at the gym or at the beach, right? So it's funny because I had all these, these, these guys in their, in their 20s coming up to me. Yo, bro. Yo, bro. 
How you get so lean, bro? How you get so cut, bro? Bro, you shredded, bro. Bro, what you eat? Bro, I've been lifting for a year, bro. Bro, bro, how many days you train your legs, bro? Uh, and I'm not even a bro. Like, I don't even say bro. I say dude. Um, so I, 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 found the, I found the comedy and that. I found the comedy and it, I'm a people watcher. I don't know if you're a people. Are you a people watcher? You know what I'm talking about? Um, in particular, <laughs> as a guy, I like looking around, perusing the scene and seeing all these like macho dudes thinking they're walking around, puffing out their chest, looking all t- <laughs> looking all t- <laughs> uh, and I just walk by and smirk. I uh, I don't I don't hide facial expressions very well. So uh, thankfully, I can handle myself well because I don't mind looking at someone and just laughing uh, if it's warranted. If it's warranted. <laughs> if it's warranted. <laughs> So, but I had a great time, so was doing that on Saturday, and then actually on the 4th of July, I have a friend, um, actually he's my mechanic, and uh, we turned into friends. Um, I mean, how could the guy who services my vehicle that I've had, like, I feel like all my life not turn into my friend? But he's an awesome mechanic, and he's a great friend, and um, uh, he has a place... Uh, a little bit further away from me, uh, it's like 15 to 20 minutes from me, but it's on the inlet, uh, body of water that bleeds into the ocean. And I uh, did a little grill out on Sunday. I saw fireworks. His, his spot was at an awesome spot. Um, and saw fireworks pretty much from a 360 degree angle from all sorts of different angles getting set off uh, from different beaches and um, people setting off fireworks. So just had had a great time. Speaking of my car, um, somewhat just to show you how attached to my vehicle I'll, I am, and, and for those that have paid attention and been following me for a little bit, I have a 2001 Acura Integra. Yes, it's only an LS, but uh, I've done quite a bit of cosmetic work to it, so it looks pretty badass. Uh, very frequent, very frequently gets stopped uh, at red lights or people passing me, giving me <laughs> props on how the car looks. Had someone ask me. If I wanted to sell it, my response, I laughed. It was very natural. I mean, it was a pretty hard laugh. And I said, if you offered me $100,000, I would consider. Um, I don't even think I would consider that. Uh, That car is like an appendage. It's like a third arm for me. I'm actually going to be doing, uh, we're going to actually get into some cryptocurrency talk, believe it or not. Uh, I'm actually going to, I'm really excited because soon I'm going to be doing some uh, body work uh, some mechanical work on it. I'm gutting out the engine. Not sure if I'm putting a B or K series in it, um, but I'm doing a major all overhaul to it and turning it into a stick shift. So it's going to be like a fun car to drive. And then I'm getting a new car later this year. So very, very, very excited about that. The last thing I want to say about driving is relating it back to driving to the supermarket. It's really kind of pissed me off shortly before this podcast. I, um, since the whole lockdown, I was using uh, Instacart. For those familiar, you can get groceries delivered. And uh, I like the service so much, I just continued it. You know, time is, is money to me. So my time is better spent doing other things than going grocery shopping, and I can afford to do it comfortably. So, um, so I'm still having gros- groceries delivered to me. And, uh, you know, when you check the... <laughs> When you're checking food out uh, on the Instacart app, sometimes you can see the nutritional content. You can read the ingredients. And um, I didn't bother to look, right? I ordered guacamole. I love guacamole. I always have guacamole or avocados on hand or both, like I do now. Why? Why in the world would you put vinegar in guacamole? I didn't look this up. I'm going to take a guess that vinegar maybe is an agent that prolongs the life of a food substance. That's just a guess. I'm just guessing. I don't know. Uh, First off, I hate vinegar. I hate, hate, fucking hate vinegar. Can't stand it. Okay? Even if you like vinegar, there are some foods where it makes 
zero sense to put vinegar in. Why would you put vinegar in salsa? Yeah, ordered some salsa, got some vinegar in that. Ordered some guacamole, vinegar in that. And I can taste it, I can't eat the shit now. I can't eat it. Guacamole, let's think about what should be in guacamole. You tell me, you tell me what should be in guacamole. You can leave a comment below, all right? You tell me what should be in guacamole. You got avocados. If you don't say avocados, we're, we're not on the same page. You don't know what guacamole is. So you got avocados. You've got onions. You've got uh, uh, red onions. You could do red onions or white onions is fine. You could even do some uh, really thin, thinly uh, diced up red tomatoes. I love to cook. If you can't tell, I love, I love cooking. Um, lime juice. Uh, some cilantro. I could put cilantro on anything. Some jalapeno pepper. Uh, am I missing anything? Oh, seasonings, of course. Salt, uh, maybe a pinch of uh, black pepper, and a little bit of a uh, touch of garlic. That's it. This shit's done. That's it. Nothing else. Uh, unless if you want to make it really spicy. It doesn't need cheese. There's no cheese in guacamole. If you're putting cheese in guacamole, chances are you need to go on a diet and you're putting cheese in everything. And for the love of God, it doesn't need vinegar. So I was a little pissed off about that. Um, yeah, so let's actually get into some uh, cryptocurrency talk. So, you know, I've been here. It is uh, July 7th. Uh, we're in the evening hours, the uh, early evening hours in the Eastern Standard Time here in uh, the state of Florida. And uh, let me ask you a question. What have I been communicating to you since May? Well, I've been communicating that we haven't topped. Right? I've been communicating to you that we're in a massive bull cycle. I provided you six independent empirical data points that has left me feeling convicted as to why that's the case. And the more that this has continued on, I said, yeah, this is a pretty, you know, significant correction. It's bearish price action, but it's within an overall zoomed out bullish cycle. Now, some people I understand, you know, one of the things that I become increasingly familiar with, uh, put all the antics aside and the humor aside of the character that I portray on Twitter. I'm an extremely logical person. Again. I, I feel like I keep saying this. If you don't know what an actuary is, Google it. The more you read about what an actuary is and, and uh, try to put yourself in my shoes and, and perhaps what I'm doing day to day, you can better appreciate where I'm coming from. I'm very logical. I'm actually a pretty emotional uh, guy. Very sentimental for all the women out there. But you know, I, when it comes to investing, I put the emotions aside and I'm very logical. And... I, I've been explaining and been very consistent in my messaging as to why we've had a severe correction we've had and why it's differed from prior bull cycles. We got very overheated, very overextended. Uh, leverage trading probably had a lot to do with it. Um, but in any case, you know, the funny thing is, real quick before I kind of speak to some of the more technicals in the charts, um, one of the interesting things I actually thought about recently was back in 2000, oh, I think it might have been early 2020, uh, maybe even late 2019. I had done some projections even at that point, and I was trying to come up with values of certain cryptocurrencies and the value of Bitcoin. Let's just talk about Bitcoin in particular. And one of the things I had inferred from the prior bull cycle was that, okay, well, if we follow a similar, similar trajectory, what we could expect is in March of 2021, Bitcoin would be up in the mid to, I think the mid, I didn't pull this up to refresh my memory, but I think mid 30,000 range. And we could expect a correction, you know, like one of the more significant corrections. And during that correction, once Bitcoin stabilizes, we could see all coins run. Well, the interesting thing about that Okay. The interesting thing about that is if the, it had played out that way, let's say Bitcoin had gone up to 35,000, uh, made a 40% correction, 
It took about four months to consolidate and move back up to retest its prior all-time high of 35,000. That's where we're at right now. So it's just sort of another thought process I had in terms of the overall market structure and how it's not, you know, at the end of the day, it's not a lot different than what I had even looked at a year ago or a year and a half ago, two years ago. Um, it's just people, you know, people, um, we're all naturally emotional, you know, and I think what happens is, especially if you're not, you know, they, they say that you're either more left sided, left brained or right sided brain, like that you're either more dominant on the left side of your brain or the right side of your brain. I'm more dominant on the left side of my brain, which is a lot more music and mathematics, um, it doesn't mean that you're, because I'm. I do tend to be more of a sensitive guy, emotional sort of person. I don't mind saying that. I think there's strength in actually admitting that. Um, it doesn't mean that you're not emotional. It's just you're a very logical person, right? You're a realist. So, um, I think a lot of people are getting very emotional over their investments. I could take some guesses as to why. You could have a lot of people in the market that really, quite frankly, don't know what they're doing. I get a lot of similar questions from a lot of people who appear to be new on Twitter. Um, they're trying to find their ground, you know, trying to find their their place in this market and understand it. And in the process, maybe they're a little over leveraged and a little a little over leveraged in terms of how much they have invested. You know, they maybe they got into the hype. You you know, the mini <laughs> what I'll call the mini euphoria stage because we haven't had the true euphoria. Um, and uh, they're upset, right? The other thing I've noticed real quick that I want to hit on that I commented on the other day, and I've seen this from a few people. I've gotten a few trolls lately. I'm, I'm learning that uh, I don't block people. So, well, I, I, well, let me take that back. I will block you if you're offensive, if you're doing something. Come, if you're, you know, I mean, obviously, if you're threatening, which I've never had. But if you're literally, if you're being offensive and being vulgar at me, yeah, I'll just block you. And I, I can't recall that happening recently. But I think the mute button, what it does is it just turns notifications off. Pretty sure on Twitter, it just turns notifications off. Like if you're gonna, if you're gonna tweet bullshit at me um, and you're gonna come at me with, and you're gonna misrepresent, you're gonna misrepresent statements I've made in the past and say things to me that aren't true, I'm just gonna mute you. It's just not worth my time. I have too many other things going on in my life. Um, I'm all for disagreements. I'm all for, uh, uh, I'm a very humble person. I can be very wrong at times um, and admit that. I have no problem with that. Uh, but if you're going to come at me and misrepresent statements I have, I just have, I have no time for it. So I'll just mute you. But I've seen some of that. I've seen some trolls and it, you know, it further reinforces the idea you have to have a thick skin because you're, you know, you're interacting with a lot of people. As much as I love Twitter and I love the fact that you can interact with people all around the world, um, and it's awesome. I've met a lot of cool people on here. The fact is you can still interact with people that are less desirable to interact with people that if you met them in person, they wouldn't be the sort of person you grab a beer with. So, um, but getting back to the Bitcoin chart, you know, one of the things I've stressed, I'm just looking at the chart right now. One of the things I've stressed is the importance of Bitcoin because, no matter what allegiance you have towards any of your altcoins, Bitcoin is going to dictate the overall uh, market. So right now, one of the patterns I have drawn, which I don't think anyone else in the market has um, shown, I haven't seen any TA on it, an ascending triangle. So I have that drawn on Twitter. The technical target that I have drawn for it is approximately... That looks like ah, around 43,000, we'll call it. Now, the nice thing about that is that would, if that pattern plays out, it would create a higher high. So one of the things I, always, uh, I also wanted to touch on here is not only am I personally looking at this ascending triangle formation, but I'm also looking at the prior, since the correction, okay, since the correction, I'm looking at the highest high that Bitcoin has created. Uh, and I'm just looking at a daily chart. And if you go back to the 15th of June, you'll see that price hit 41,341.57 on the Bitstamp exchange. So we'll call it 
you know, we'll just call it 41,300. Okay, 41,300. So what we want to do now, and this is a basic premise within technical analysis is uh, for bullish price action, you want to see higher highs and higher lows. So one of the things we want to see eventually happen here is we want to see Bitcoin um, hit a price higher than 41,300. Okay. Now, the interesting thing about that price area is the other thing that happens um, in charts is once you fall below moving averages, they become resistance. When you're above moving averages, those moving averages act as areas of support, right? But once you break below the moving averages, they act as areas of resistance. So just speaking to the moving, moving averages, the interesting thing is the 50, so I'm looking at a daily chart. The 50 simple moving average is right at the line, uh, the, the upper horizontal line of the ascending triangle I have drawn. It's literally right at like 36,000. Um, and then the other interesting thing is that the technical target for the ascending triangle, if that pattern plays out, is basically right at the 200 SMA at 44,000. So we really have to start clearing some resistance between 36 and 44,000 to start getting super, super bullish here that we're gonna break. Um, we're gonna begin building structure uh, to break out above that 65,000 target. Um, now, Oh, the other thing, real quick, the other thing I wanted to comment on the on the daily chart, and I've tweeted about all this stuff. So again, if you're not following me on Twitter, you're losing out. I mean, I, I post about this stuff as, uh, tweet about this stuff as often as I can. But as I always say, um, I have a full-time job that keeps me very busy. So, you know, it kind of comes in, in, in spurts where I have more or less time to tweet about things and put charts up. I feel like this week in particular, maybe last week, I was a little um, less active. It's been pretty busy at work, so I just I have not um, had as much time to kind of put some charts out there. Plus, it's a little more difficult in the environment we are in. I've kind of been learning that I think one of the best things you can do as a content creator is kind of take your foot off the pedal and just let the market cool off um, because there isn't there isn't as much to say, right? We're in consolidation mode right now. We found our bottom. We're not going lower. Um, and until we start making moves higher, there isn't anything really exciting to tweet about or put videos out about, quite frankly. But the other thing I wanted to speak to was this RSI. So one of the things that... Um, uh, is present on the daily chart here is the negative divergence on the RSI. So one of the things we want to see is we want to see that negative divergence get negated. So we want to begin creating higher highs in the RSI that are higher than previous highs that'll negate that whole bearish divergence on the relative strength index or the RSI. You know, one of the things I'll, uh, I'll give you a little clue on how you can kind of see uh, make some inferences on a potentially uh, sort of a leading indicator, a leading indicator in terms of if we can expect uh, at some point in the shorter term, if we could begin to invalidate that on the daily. What you can actually do is you can zoom in on a smaller time frame. So as an example, uh, one of the things I noted when I was looking at the chart is if I zoomed out to a 12-hour chart, okay, a 12-hour chart, um, what I began to see was that some of that negative divergence began to become invalidated. Uh, and you can actually see it even if I zoom further out on a four-hour chart, you can see it's a lot less uh, present. But once you, when you zoom out on those smaller time frames, a four-hour chart or a 12-hour chart, and you begin to see some negative divergence on those charts, get negated, you can start to infer, okay, this is going to bleed over into a higher time frame like the daily. And one of the things that I've, I've hit on consistently in a lot of my um, content is the larger time frame uh, charts, 
they have more credibility to them. Each candlestick comprises more data. And so the larger time frame charts hold more credibility within uh, the view that you're looking at. So a monthly view, you know, depending upon how much price history you have, a monthly view where each candlestick represents one month of price action, that's a lot more credible. Again, historically, depending upon how much data is present. If, if, if something's only been around for one year and you're looking at a one month chart, it's not very significant. If something's been around for 10 years and you're looking at a one month chart, then it's very significant. But the point is a one month chart, you know, all else being equal, a one month chart is more significant than a one day chart. A one day chart is more significant than a four hour chart. And what I also try to preach, preach all, um, what I try to preach, we don't talk religion and we don't talk politics on this channel. So I'm not going to actually preach. Um, but one thing I always preach, what, what do I preach? What do I preach? Where was I going with this? I, you, you know, you ever completely lose your train of thought? You know, I was really going there. I had some momentum. You know, you were listening to me. You were expecting some sort of massive conclusion. And I completely forget where I was going with that. Oh, maybe this was it. I don't know, but we're going to go with it. This is what I just thought of. One thing I always preach to you uh, on this channel uh, and in the content that I have is to zoom out and look at the bigger picture. Um, I don't provide content for day traders. You know, I'm not out here putting out charts to day trade. The reality is most day traders, people that are trying to uh, have a source of revenue or income based on buying and selling stocks in a single day or a day or two or whatever. Uh, most people lose at that. They're not very successful. And um, I think the most prudent thing to do is to pick the avenue of higher success, which is to invest for a longer time horizon and to simply buy and sell at logical uh, prices. So that, that's what this channel is geared towards. So um, just please keep that in mind. But what I would say to you is I am extremely, extremely convicted uh, given all the information that I have provided in the past. If you look at my videos and my tweets, I am extremely convicted uh, that we are heading much, much, much higher and the bull market cycle top is not in, unless it goes to zero, which is always a chance. You know, there's always a probability for that. What if I was one of those content creators that just like came out, made a convicted statement, and then just sort of, like, sort of just quietly backed off and just, uh, you know, just quietly backed off of it and made a completely contrar contrarian statement? I am extremely convicted that. Uh, you know, Bitcoin is the next digital gold, and it is going to exceed the market capitalization of gold. Well, unless if it doesn't, in which case there's always a chance for that, it could go to zero. You know, <laughs> what if I was that guy? What if I was that guy? Um, but, uh, you know, in all seriousness, the good people out there, you know, if you follow me on Twitter, um, you know, you should know who's technical analysis that I value because many times I will thank those content creators. Many of them have um, YouTube channels. Some of them do not have YouTube channels. But if you're paying close attention and looking at where I comment and, and um, you know, who, who I'm kind of pointing out. In fact, I tweeted something pretty recently um, with some specific people that are on both Twitter and YouTube whose content that I value, right? Because here's the thing. I've said this since day one. If you actually go to my YouTube channel and you look at the intro video, I stress that I hope, I hope, um, that you use my channel and my content as a data source in your own independent analysis. Like the ownership's on you. The ownership is all on you. <laughs> it's not, you should not be coming to me and saying crypto bull God said that, uh, XRP is going to $10, and so I'm going to put my life savings in it because this dude's jacked as shit, and uh, he's an actuary, and this, I mean, he can't be wrong. Like, there's no fucking way. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Are you kidding me? 
that would be the most moronic thing that you could do. What you should do, what you should do is you should listen to what information it is that I'm providing to you and discern whether or not it's logical. And if it's logical, then you should put it in your toolbox and you should um, listen to what I have to say and um, weigh that against how you personally feel and how your other uh, data points, what, what they say, right? So I do the same thing. There are content creators I listen to and I kind of weigh how they feel against how I feel or what they're seeing in the charts versus what I see in the charts. Sometimes I disagree with them. There's stuff out there I disagree with, with and that's healthy. Um, you can be very well educated and have a viewpoint and be incorrect or correct. We'll never know. Uh, the further, further we move on, we'll know. But I think having a difference in opinion is very valuable. It's extremely valuable. So I don't follow everyone because they agree with me. I follow everyone because the people I follow is because I feel like they put out material that is non-hype. I feel like they put out logical material. I understand what they're saying. Uh, I see value in their TA and their thought process. Um, and I use that as a data point in my own independent decisions to, uh, how I want to invest. So I, I hope you do the same thing. The one thing I can't stand that I've seen a lot of, and I think I've seen this a lot more because of the emotional state of the market. Uh, when emotions are very high, I think there's some people out there that try to capitalize on it for their own personal gain. Um, it is sickening to me, absolutely sickening to me, um, to see some of the, the clickbait that's out there on YouTube. I'll just leave it at that. Really be careful about who you follow and what their intentions are. You know, I, uh, for all of the people who follow me and listen to, the input that I have, I sincerely, sincerely thank you from the bottom of my heart. I mean, this is something I'm really passionate about. Um, and I know my character sometimes out, can be a little out there, but I'm just looking to do something unique, right? But at the end of the day, um, the information I share with you is genuinely from the bottom of my heart. Well, nah, I wouldn't even say from the bottom of my heart. That's a little, I don't know, sounds a little cheesy, right? I would say from the bottom of my heart. I would say the information I'm sharing with you is uh, 100%, you know, hand on the Bible, you know, swear on my grandparents' grave, graves, um, what I see in the charts, you know, and it's how I'm approaching the market. And so I'm just sharing it with you. I just, I love teaching, you know, it's just, I genuinely love teaching and uh, I'm going to be, I'm going to be wrong. I'm going to be, I have been wrong and I'm going to be wrong about some things and I'm going to be correct uh, and I have been correct about some things. But at the end of the day, the way that I think you should judge me in terms of how valuable I am to the spaces on the bigger items, you know, to the bigger items uh, that he weighed in on and gave an opinion, the crypto bull god weighed in and gave an opinion, was he right or was he wrong? You know, look at the messaging I'm putting out there. The messaging I'm putting out there. Like, I'll give you, I'll give you an example. We're in a motherfucking bull market, and this is a bearish price action we're seeing in some corrections. But we are in a motherfucking bull market, okay? And I've been consistent about that. So judge me at the end of the year if I've been correct with that or not, you know? Um, <laughs> one other thing I wanted to hit on. I wanted to ask for people's opinions on this, and I want you to comment on it uh, before we get to Twitter questions in the chart of the week. The Bitcoin Mining Council. Can I get everyone's thoughts on this? Because I read their mission statement. I don't know. You can go to their website and read their mission statement. I jokingly tweeted about something saying the Bitcoin Mining Council. Like, that sounds a little centralized, doesn't it? If you want to piss off some... Bitcoin maxis say that the Bitcoin Mining Council is, is uh, centralized. I will say this on a serious note. While I'm not super familiar, I'm not super familiar. I know the lunatic, crazy person, Michael Saylor, <laughs> is the head of, the head of this council. That guy is, I don't know, is something off with him, I think, personally. But anyway, um, uh, there's something on the surface Okay, without having, 
with only having a surface level understanding of what the Bitcoin Mining Council is, there's something surface level. Okay, I'm telling you, I don't have a very firm foundation of uh, understanding of what, what it is. There is something concerning to me personally knowing that there's a Bitcoin Mining Council. There's now a council surrounding something that's supposed to be decentralized and for the people. And I don't know, my, the way my mind is going with this is th this is how a government starts and then rules get enacted and uh, there's a bigger central authority deciding this or that with Bitcoin. I, I just, I don't know. I, I'm actually being honest with you, all kidding aside, the Bitcoin Mining Council, it, it, it sounds a little cheesy to me. Uh, I do have some concerns with it in terms of where this could go and other things that could spur out of this. Um, so I would be curious to get other people's thoughts. Um, but in any event, let's jump to the chart of the week. The chart of the week without question was something I had tweeted about, I think, yesterday and then today. Uh, well, no, not yesterday and today. I've tweeted about it quite a bit. But I've, charted, I, I've tweeted about this recently, uh, the past, what, week? I talked about a downward line of resistance getting broken. Um, watch for this downward line of resistance getting broken. When it did, watch for it to backtest and move up. And we did just that. And the chart of the week is the Holy Spirit, one part of the Holy Crypto Trinity, uh, MANA. Ticker symbol M-A-N-A. -A. M is in Mary, A is in Apple. N is in Nancy. Remember the last podcast, Nancy? Nancy uh, knows what's best for Nancy. And A is an apple, mana. So the awesome thing about this, this actually, this is one of these charts I tweeted about that happened to work out perfectly. Not every time do you tweet about something does it work out perfectly. I printed this zone that I was expecting to get some resistance at between 75 and 80, and we literally hit 80 cents on the dot. Now, what I would like, what would show me the greatest strength within this chart, in case if you're looking at mana right now on a one-day chart, I'd like to see all of the candle body closes, okay? Remember, price wicks are an expression of volatility, so we can wick below. But I'd like to see all of the candle body closes remain at and above the 200 simple moving average, which is approximately 65 cents. That would be very bullish because... What we would begin to do is we would begin to create higher highs, higher lows, build a foundation on the 200 SMA and begin moving up. And the prior all-time high, which is $1.68, once that thing is broken, okay, once that thing is broken, um, we'll revisit kind of what to expect moving forward. But the chart of the week is one part of the holy crypto trinity. It is mana, Decentraland, virtual land. The NFT space. That's all I have to say. All right, so let's get into uh, some Twitter questions here. Uh, thank you for the engagement. Uh, once again. Um, it's too much work to write all these things down. It's just easier to actually go to the questions. So this is in no particular order. Um, how long, this is literally in no particular order, how long until HBAR pops off? That's a great question. I don't have an answer for you. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's consolidating. I, I tweet about HBAR all the time. It's consolidating. Truth be told, uh, let's go back. I'm looking at a daily chart right now. I will speak to the chart specifically. I'll say a couple things. Um, when we made that strong move up on... It was the 13th of May, that massive green candle. I thought that was the beginning of price expansion up, and I thought we were going to break uh, 46 cents, and we were going to begin uh, going towards a dollar. Didn't happen. So we're just still consolidating. They're still consolidating. I do tweet about uh, charts on HBAR pretty frequently, so just follow me on Twitter to get my personal views on it. One thing I will say... One newer view I was looking at, which I'm going to be keeping an eye on beyond all the other things that I've indicated on Twitter, it's actually the three-day chart. One of the things I've noticed is candle body closes for a long time now have been below the 10-day simple moving average. So 
something that would at least uh, be a flag to me that we may potentially be beginning some momentum towards a potential. I say potential. All these things are potentials. There's no guarantees. But one of the things I would be looking for in the chart beyond that, I mean, I'm looking at the MACD and the KST, which are both looking like they want to curl up on the three day. But for the three day, one of the things I'd be looking for is for a candle body close above the 10 SMA. Now, for your just for your uh, visual or for your understanding, because you can't see this, the next three day candle closes tomorrow. If we can close above, you know, we'll call it above 19.2 cents. Um, but the next three day can't. So if we start to get closes, I would just say at like 20 cents and above, that would be a, um, an, a bullish indicator that we may begin seeing some momentum building to build some structure to begin to move up. The thing's just consolidating right now. I have no doubts whatsoever that it, we're going to be going massively higher. You can check out the H Barbarians video. It's just a matter of time. It's one of the hardest things to do. I mean, I think a lot of impatient people, a lot of people, you know, the questions where I get where people want to know exactly when things are going to pop off and how high they're going to go. These are the people that, quite frankly, look, I value every single person that follows me. But if all you're tweeting me, if all your questions to me are, when's this going to happen and where's it going to? you've really got to ask yourself some hard questions on how educated you are on this market. Nobody in this space can tell you exactly when something's going to pop off. I can tell you uh, a likely what I see in the charts in terms of my expectation on a range of time when we might see something pop off but um, or start to enter some price discovery, but it's just an educated guess. It's, timing is so, so difficult. Um, the other thing is here, CSC, I have no idea what CSC is, so sorry, I don't, I don't know that. Um, this is a good question. <clears throat> so the question really surrounds how someone should be allocated. It really gets at DeFi. You know, one of the things I hit on is decentralized finances really seems to be the theme of this bull cycle. I know NFTs have come in. There's meme coins, which I'm not into. I'm not going to get into that. Um, NFTs and DeFi. I would say DeFi is dominating uh, besides, beside, DeFi is dominating beside uh, NFTs. Um the narrative within this bull cycle. So I to answer this question about how you should be, I think you should definitely be allocated in crypto projects that have decentralized finance as a component of uh, the underlying theme of why you would invest in it, right? So you're talking about things like, I mean, I'll just tell you, I mean, I, I tweet about these charts. I mean, anything, you know, I don't go into, let me just say this. I don't go into how I'm allocated, like what percentage of my portfolio is allocated to this or how much I own of something. I will never, I have no reason to. I will never disclose that. That's private information. No one knows that outside of me. But I don't have a, I don't have a problem. I don't have a problem indicating what I'm invested in or what I'm not invested in. You know, charts that center around decentralized finance that I will chart about or speak to, you know, you're talking about Ethereum. You're talking about uh, Chainlink. You're talking about Uniswap. Uh, you're talking about Harmony One. Um, I mean, one, you know, the Sun, uh, part of the the Holy Crypto Trinity. Obviously, I'm very invested in that, so I don't. I shouldn't have to speak to that. But yeah, I mean, you're. I don't want to say what's going to outperform what, but given that decentralized finance and NFTs are a huge prominent narrative within this cycle. You definitely want to make sure you're allocated as such. Ultra bull target for one. Great question. My super saiyan. Bull target for one. Uh, if you go to my Holy Crypto Trinity video, Mitch, you will see. I hope you didn't hear that, mishear that to say bitch. I said Mitch, not bitch. I didn't say bitch. I said Mitch. Mitch, I appreciate the question. You know, sometimes you can mishear someone when they're talking, so I just want to make sure you didn't, uh, you didn't hear me wrong. 
So, Mitch, this is a very good question. This is uh, this is a non-standard question. No one a- ever asks people for targets. This is a super original question. <laughs> no, I'm joking with you. If you go to the uh, Holy Crypto Trinity video, you'll see what my uh, my highest price target range is for one. Let me do you the favor of, of just telling you. Um, so... What I looked at as a potential account, this is a huge disclaimer. I'm not telling you this is where price is going. Okay? This is just a super high projected target based on prior cycles, right? If one does a 1,000x at the top of this bull cycle relative to its price on January 1st of 2021... It will hit just over four dollars, four dollars and twenty-four cents. Now, what do I think is more likely? Let me actually tell you what I think is more likely, Mitch. What I think is more likely is we'll get we'll get in the two-dollar range. I think we'll definitely. I'd be surprised if we didn't get in the two-dollar range. So, a lot of people, psychological level, are talking about a dollar. I think we're going to blow past a dollar. Um, but I, I'd be surprised if we didn't get in the $2 range. Um, uh, these aren't really questions. These are more statements. 90% of the... Uh, okay. Uh, see the short term. Okay, I don't see any questions there. All right, I know there were a couple more questions real quick. Um... Short-term targets we need to break above. I'm assuming you mean Bitcoin. I kind of already spoke to that. Timeline predictions for favorite alt. Yeah, so I already spoke to short-term targets on Bitcoin much earlier in the podcast. Wow, this podcast is going super long. I hope you find this content interesting because at this point, if you've been listening for 46 minutes, uh, close to 47 minutes, uh, either you like the sound of my voice, you've fallen asleep, <laughs> or you've pretty much tuned me out and are multitasking, uh, or you find what I'm saying is interesting, which is exciting and scary at the same time. So, key targets. I already spoke to it, my friend. Steve? Steve, I already spoke to that, buddy. Uh, so you got that. Timeline predictions for favorite alts. Well, remember, remember, I've spoken to this, my friend. Steve, what did I tell you was the most prominent timeline for a Bitcoin cycle top, in my opinion? Well, in my opinion, it was between September to December, based on this correction. Of course, uh, the more time goes on, we'll refine that, but... The most likely scenario is September to December. Let's just stick with that, right? And then I said the sweet spot. To me, the sweet spot is Bitcoin topping between the middle of October to the middle of November, right? So a lot of the altcoins will be topping out of that, after that, out of that? A lot of the altcoins will be topping after that because the money that will flow out of Bitcoin will flow into the altcoins and they'll pump hard as shit. So, you know, whenever Bitcoin tops... Okay, based on those timelines I gave you, alts will top a little bit after that, but around the same time. Someone's asking me a question about physique and body fat percentage, and I couldn't tell if this person was high, drunk, trolling me, or being serious. So what I would say is if you were high or drunk tweeting me this, props to you. If you're being a troll, fuck you. And if you're being serious, well, thank you. (laughs) That's what I would say. As far as physique and body fat percentage, um, just what I would, I would just keep it to this. Any advice? Um, Yeah, I, I do have some advice. Common sense. One of my favorite. Uh, sayings of all time is prescriptions for wishful thinking, right? Everybody wants the newest diet. Everybody wants the newest fat. Everybody wants the the latest workout program and shell out, shell out money for that, um, for a quick turnaround. There is no quick turnaround. 
there's a good, let me put it in these terms. There's a good chance that many of my followers, okay, your age, consistently, cons- literally consistently, never a break, never a break, never a week off, a month off. I had a serious injury, took time off. I have consistently worked out longer than you've been alive. Think about that one, okay? So consistently doing something, persevering over obstacles, you know, prioritizing it, making sure you have a balance in life and you're making time for yourself to, to exercise. And then as far as diet, of course, you have to have the workout, right workout program in place, which takes time to develop. Diet takes time as well. You know, I try all sorts of diet fads. And uh, I finally got to a point in my life more recently in the past couple of years where I just, I eat well. I eat a very balanced diet. I don't binge on foods because I don't feel deprived of anything. And I think the reason I don't feel deprived of anything, uh, a lot of times people that binge on foods is because their body is naturally deprived of something. I don't binge on anything because I eat plenty of fats, plenty of carbohydrates, plenty of proteins, I eat a wide variety. I don't have cheat days. Don't do cheat days. Uh, this, uh, once I'm done with this podcast, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go out. I'm going to make dinner. I don't know what I'm exactly having. I might have some tofu, uh, actually. Sometimes I do vegan dinners. Of course, this isn't vegan, what I'm about to say, but I might put some... Oh, no, wait. This is still vegan. I might put some French fries in the air fryer. You know, I feel like having some fucking French fries. I'm going to have some motherfucking French fries. So I have, quote, unquote... I wouldn't even say bad food because they're healthier, French fries, but I have uh, cheat foods or foods that aren't as healthy for you. Um, You know, I I dabble that in here and there, but uh, I do something that is sustainable for the long term. That's the idea you have to have. You can't do something for the short term. You have to implement an exercise program for yourself and an eating style that will work for the long term. And if you've developed a lot of bad habits, it's going to take you quite a bit of time to dig yourself out of that hole or climb yourself out of that hole. So just be patient with yourself. That's my advice. Um, last Twitter question, then we're going to close things out here. If you've stuck around 50 minutes into this podcast, God bless your soul because I don't know how you have. Boy, this is a long podcast. Jesus. All right. Serious question here. That's what he said. Serious question. Serious question. This is not, he's not joking around. Confirmation. You know, this is actually, so shout out to Mr. Legend. I don't know what that image is that you got going on there, but on your Twitter profile photo. But shout out to Mr. Legend, because this is actually a very, very good question. So essentially what this individual is getting at, thank you for your follow. Are you following me? I think. I've seen your tweets, your replies before. Yeah. Thank you for the follow. Thank you for following. And let me reply, because this is actually some really good stuff that you're tweeting at me here. So the question is, because... Essentially, what it's getting at is how do I assure myself and my audience that I don't have confirmation bias, that I basically don't have bias in any way? Because, look, I am a huge bull overall when it comes to the cryptocurrency space. I think it is disruptive technology in the financial technology space, um, and it's going to be integrated in ways that we don't even see or know about. Uh, The common person doesn't know, at least. And there really is generational wealth transfer opportunity here. And so how do I ensure that the material I'm putting out there and the, and the decisions I'm making is not biased in any way? This is an awesome question. So what I would tell you is I use logic and, uh, robotic, uh, non-emotional decision processes to formulate my decisions. Now, how do I validate what I just said? Well, I put out a video many, many weeks back that gave empirical data points. Why do you think I phrase things as data? Why do you think I phrase things as data points, right? I am, okay, I'm a positive person. I'm a very, uh, I've already kind of joked about this. I'm actually more of a sentimental person and more of an emotional sort of guy. I think there's actually, like I said, I think there's actually strength in saying that. I don't have a problem saying that. Um, But 
I'm also a realist. I'm also a logical person. I'm an actuary. Okay. I look at numbers all motherfucking day. And so when I'm making decisions on things, I'm very used to, I'm very accustomed to, uh, it's very natural. It's in me to look at numbers. Boom. You show me a number and I'm going to tell you a story. Look, I'll give, I'll give you an example. Man, this is not a great example, but it's on my mind and I'm going to tell you. I would love to get married again someday. But, you know, the numbers say, you know, you find someone who has a household where they have divorced parents and the likelihood is, at least if you're, there's one person in the couple who has married uh, parents who were divorced, uh, you have a less likelihood of succeeding in your marriage. Like that's something that I think about. I don't know if that's the greatest example, but I think about it. <laughs> so the point is, is to illustrate the idea that I am very analytical. So the way I kind of check myself is that I'm analytical. I look at charts and I look at data and th that data formulates my opinion. One of the ways that I will best be able to show you this, Mr. Legend, is when we start to enter true euphoria and I'm stressing that it would be smart to begin scaling out, right? Because I'm very bullish on this space, but it's going to reach a point where I'm looking at charts, the same charts I've shared with you guys repeatedly, guys and girls repeatedly. I'm going to look at them and I'm going to say they're overextended and it would be smart to scale out 10%, 20%, 20%, you know, scale out. Um, so that's how I keep myself checked. I just look at uh, empirical data points. That is what I do as a mathematician and actuary. But it's a very, very good question. This is the best question I was asked. You know, questions like this, I'll say this and then we're going to hop off. Questions like this, I honest to God appreciate much more than tell me when and how high we're going on something. When and how high we're going on something, quite honestly, sometimes gets really nauseating at points. I want people... People engage me with more thought-provoking questions. This is a very good question. So in closing, uh, I would like to say, please give the video, please give the podcast a like. Please drop a comment. Please subscribe to the channel. I don't know why I'm talking in this voice. But I hope you enjoyed the content. Uh, I'm going to be... Uh, out of commission for a little bit because I'm going to be traveling. So I don't know when I'm putting out the uh, next TA video or podcast. It'll either be late, late July or more towards the beginning of August. So thank you to everyone who engages uh, and is following and subscribe. Really appreciate it. Hoping to get Chart Mania. Still not at a thousand. You know, really frustrated. Still not at a thousand subscribers on my YouTube channel. I know it's largely in part because I don't have the time to dedicate to it right now. Someday that will change. I promise you that. Uh, and I know my subscriber growth will, will be much higher than it is now. But, you know, to the degree possible, please share the content. I'd like to get up to 1,000 subscribers so I can get Chart Mania going. Uh, in closing, please join me in a moment of silence for all of those I attempted on multiple occasions to get into crypto and have remained ignorant. I don't know what that was either. Thank you.